My name is Sandhya Eknaligoda. I am the wife of a journalist from Sri Lanka and a mother of two sons. However, I would like to introduce myself as a person as a human rights activist who became a human rights activist because her husband was abducted. I am a creative protester. I am a woman who knows herself. I consider myself to be a creative protester because throughout my activism, I have always incorporated aspects of culture and stories of women who became victims. I have always incorporated them into my struggle, into my protests. Their pain, their suffering and vengeance is all part of that. I say that I have sacrificed myself to this cause because by today, by this year, I have shown my head, I have given up my hair and I am dressed in all black uh, in sacrifice. So one day, until such day that justice is served in Sri Lanka, I will not grow my hair and I will not. I did not uh, hear the question clearly. Could you please repeat the question? My question was whether you could introduce yourself to the tribunal. I am a woman who became a human rights activist and a protester as a result of the abduction of her husband. I consider myself to be a creative protester and I have sacrificed myself to achieving a goal and all over the world as well as in Sri Lanka, I seek justice and truth. I am a woman who seeks justice and truth. I say that I am a creative protester because throughout the acts of protest that I have engaged in, I incorporated different cultural and religious aspects into my struggle in order to portray the pain, the suffering and the vengeance that powerful women who have become victims have had to feel because of the injustices that they had to face. I represent these women who have who are victims and also today i am i said that i have sacrificed myself the image you see before me is not what it was earlier i had a long luscious hair but i have shorn my hair i have given up my hair and today, I have done this because I demand truth and justice. One day, until I find justice in Sri Lanka, I will not allow, let my hair to grow back again. I am dressed all in black and I am wearing a red shawl. This will be my dress throughout this time. This is my sacrifice until such time that I achieve justice that I seek.
Could you please describe for the court um, the type of journalistic work that your husband, Pragit Etnaligoda, engaged in? Pragit Etnaligoda is a person who spoke about social, economic, uh, political, and gender-related matters in Sri Lanka, including corruption, thefts, and any such related things. He was a journalist and also a cartoonist. His pen and his brushes were used to educate people. And during the time of war, he wrote about social injustice that occurred in Sri Lanka. He spoke about the status of women in Sri Lanka. And in particular, he spoke about, he brought to light uh, corruption and malpractices by the Rajapaksas. He, he wrote about it. He drew cartoons about it. He considered this to be his responsibility as a journalist. Could you speak to the tribunal about the events that led to the first kidnapping of your husband in August 2009. For the very first time, Pragit was abducted in August 2009. At that time, he had been continuously writing about corruption by the Rajapaksa regime. In year 2008, the war was raging in Sri Lanka. At a time like that, Pragit wrote and he uh, educated uh, small groups of people about the use of chemical weapons in Sri Lanka. And also, if any person has used any chemical weapons in any location at all, it would have been targeted at the society in general. That is what he said. His example for this was that if we add chemical fertilizer or pesticides on our agricultural land, we cannot uh, kill only the pests and uh, save uh, whatever uh, creatures that are helpful to us. He wrote about this. And he uh, educated uh, small groups of people about this. He shared information about the use of chemical weapons. This is the point at which, at an unexpected time, in August 2009, Pragit, he was in one of our farmlands in Sigiriya. He was on his way back home. It was during the night that he was abducted. On the very next day, he was released, claiming that it was a mistake. Later on, the criminal investigation department found that the two, both these uh, uh, acts are carried out by the same group. So the second incident is an extension of the first incident. The second incident occurred in year 2010. You mentioned the criminal investigation. What steps did Pravi take after the first kidnapping attempt? Mm -hmm. 
After the uh, first incident, Uh, so he had with him the piece of cloth they used to tie his uh, to blindfold him during that first incident so he went to the homagama police station and lodged a complaint that is what uh, in sri lanka that is what you do usually he went to the police and complained the police officers came to our home and they took over that uh, piece of cloth that was used as a blindfold but after that they did not pursue any investigation into the matter after 2010 when we were looking into uh, what happened that uh, very first uh, complaint that he made had also gone missing mentioned the second kidnapping could you describe to us what happened on that day on 24th january 2010 prageet uh, at the end of his day he had taken his medication and he left home after that first incident he never stopped what he was doing he continued the work that he did he had the stance his firm belief was that the rajapaksa regime should come to an end in 2010 there was an election so he supported sarat fonseca the uh, the opponent of the rajapaksa regime during that election he supported that individual during that election and at some point uh, around 10 pm he left home but prageet never came home after that later on from his friends i found out that on that day prageet was expecting to meet a friend and he he, he at that time he used to work at uh, an organization called lanka e news and he had left lanka e news around 8 pm and after that i do not know what happened to him after that on 25th of january 2010 when pragit did not return home that night this was on uh, by this is the night of 25th i felt that something is really wrong and pragit is in trouble this is a telegram you're telling us on the 25th of january 2010 that pragit did not come back home and that you felt Pragit did not come home on the 24th so by the night of the 24th i began to feel very strongly that something's really wrong and pragit is in trouble and then on the morning of the 25th i went to the homagama police station to lodge a complaint about this however by that time i understood that when i got there they already knew to expect me they knew that i would be coming there first uh, i mentioned to a lower ranking official that i am here to lodge a complaint 
then that official went out and got the officer in charge the oic of that police station the name of that oic is uh, jaya sundara so this uh, officer in charge the oic kept on arguing with me without accepting my complaint they kept saying that pragit is in hiding and that i am here to make a false complaint at the end when i demanded are you going to accept my complaint or not he said this is not under our jurisdiction this matter is does not come under our uh, jurisdiction but we will accept his uh, uh, we will accept this complaint but you will have to go to the koswatta police station uh, where pragit was last uh, seen so ultimately i lodged two complaints in both of these police stations Did you go to any other Sri Lankan institutions to lodge complaints about disappearance of Pratik? Yes, I did. Oh. After that, oh. on thirty first of January, twenty ten, I went to the Sri Lanka Human Rights Commission. i went there with an attorney the human rights commission too did not accept my complaint they said it is not relevant to them there was an official there the lawyer who went with me had to argue with that official to convince them that they should be accepting this complaint ultimately he was uh, rather this uh, rather uh, he was rather irritated and still he gave uh, an application form for me to fill later on uh, no progress was made by the investigations carried out by the sri lanka human rights commission in addition to that i went before the sri lankan courts i went to the united nations uh, the, the the local representatives of the united nations and the red cross as well after you got no effective response um, in relation to your complaints when did you go to the courts in sri lanka and what happened it was in it was on 19th february 2010 that i went to the sri lankan courts i filed a habeas corpus writ that is what i wanted to do i uh, one stroke 2010 is the uh, case number so they uh, accepted that complaint so a writ of habeas corpus was uh, applied and in 2011 this matter came to the homagama uh, courts from the colombo courts by 2016 up until 2016 this habeas corpus file uh, case was uh, being heard however the attorney general's department actually sometimes the officials who came they are they came, they made some uh, uh, they they presented some false facts and uh, in 2016 the matter was handed over to the criminal investigation division then the attorney general's department claimed that 
the same matter is being discussed in two different courts and one case should be withdrawn. However, currently this uh, case is on hold. They have suspended hearing uh, of one case until the, until the other case is uh, concluded. That is the current situation. Is anyone ever arrested for the abduction of Nelson? Yeah. Yeah. I mentioned that from 2010 to 2016, the writ of habeas corpus was being heard. In 2015, a change, a political change happens in Sri Lanka. The Rajapaksa regime that was in power was toppled by the people of Sri Lanka. So with that change, some of the uh, more controversial and highly discussed uh, crimes, such as the La Santa's crime and uh, these um, other crimes against journalists, including Pragit, and also the crime of uh, the, or the killing of uh, Tajuddin. All these matters were uh, handed over to the Criminal Investigation Department the Bureau uh, for this to be investigated. So there is a potential for that to be done. Uh, there, is, uh, there is provisions for that to be done, but until 2015, this never happened. But in 2015, these matters are handed over to the Criminal uh, Investigation di uh, Division. Uh, it, it came under the under SSP Shani Abesekara and the unit that he uh, that comes under him. So within some time period after that, the first abduction of pra Pragit as well as the second disappearance of uh, Pragit. They find that both these matters, both these acts were committed by the same group and that they are intelligence officials from the army and they were uh, produced, they were taken into custody, they were produced before the courts. The CID continues this uh, investigation. So that is how. An individual called Shammi Kumar Ratna, he is a intelligent, he is a colonel from the intelligence uh, bureau and a number of other officials. They are all, all together 12, uh, offic uh, 12 uh, intelligence officers were taken into custody by the criminal investigation division. After that, they were produced before the courts, and by now, charges have been filed against them, and they are now out on bail. Could you speak to us about the presidential task force established in 2019? with regards to political victimization, which means with regards to investigations against military officials involved in crimes against journalists. In the matter of uh, the disappearance of Pragit. During the period between 2015 and 2019, I had to face some very, very unpleasant experiences. Although the Rajapaksas were not in power at that time, the state mechanism established by the Rajapaksas still had Rajapaksa cronies in places of power. In particular, 
in uh, electronic media and on on the internet they had the ability to harass me as a result i faced many many difficulties in 2016 i was directly harassed when i was uh, inside the court's premises and in 2019 when uh, before before gotabe rajapaksa came to power he said that on the very next day after he comes to power he plans to release all these uh, intelligence officers who are under custody uh, because of uh, cases related to prageet lasanta etc who have been so even then there was plenty of ample um, evidence to prove that they were connected uh, the rajapaksas were had involvement even when these uh, intelligence officials were in uh, the prison rajapaksas went to visit them in 2019 gotabe rajapaksa comes to power after actually so even uh, before that it was soon before that he came to power the attorney general's department uh, files charges against these uh, uh, individuals uh, in in front of the homagama uh, courts and the permanent uh, tr- bench uh, president after gotabe rajapaksa becomes the president in 2020 he establishes a commission a commission to look into acts of political vengeance between 2015 and 20, 2020 so this commission all of these uh, criminals uh, who were connected uh, to uh, these abductions and attacks on uh, prageet uh, uh, keet noya and everybody all these uh, suspects were released and uh, recommendations were issued by this commission these recommendations stated that the crimi- the, the officials from the criminal investigation department that Uh, carried out uh, these investigations should also be prosecuted this uh, permanent uh, tri person uh, bench was also disregarded and uh, major rambanda there is a uh, major rambanda an eye witness was uh, coerced and uh, the so they uh, changed their statements saying that they were coerced so this commission was used by gotabe rajapaksa to give impunity to these criminals that was his first attempt Thank you for sharing with us what happened to your husband. Um I want to ask you what are the similarities if any that you see between the case of your husband's abduction um and the murder of La Santa Vikramatunge. Yes. Uh, oh. First of all, this abduction and uh, this uh, incident 
are similar because they were both responsible journalists and the responsible journalist activities that they did were des- desecrated by this act the duty and responsibility of any journalist should be bringing to light all crimes and acts of corruption that occur in a society the entire society has a right to know there has to be free flow of information uh, to the society and these journalists were fulfilling this duty and rajapaksas destroyed that secondly these these groups with power these groups with political power committed these crimes and they are making attempts to hide these crimes for on one hand both these investigations kept on dragging for a long time period period of time and there is also impunity so certain institutions uh, have been taken over by them to ensure that there is impunity to the uh, offenders it could be the courts of law it could be the it could be other organizations they have been taken over by these authorities and then now i have experience in the courts of law where as uh, the judges uh, were changed to suit their needs and also the other similarity that i see in these two cases is that i see there is lack of accountability and there is also impunity within sri lanka none of the governments successive governments that came into power took any action against these military officials i say this because very clearly the rajapaksas who got their cronies to do this uh, dirty work for them and also the good governance government the president of that government to that is in uh, in uh, by around six, uh, september of 2016 uh, that president to uh, very publicly states that these military officials should not be incarcerated so perhaps he also intervened in the matter of uh, ensuring that bail is granted to these suspects there were many talks about this in society during that time so these are some of the similarities that i see and i also mentioned that i have experiences where the judge uh, where the judges were uh, tra- changed now the one uh, justice one judge who uh, was uh, hearing the matter of uh, pragit had been connected to uh, the military he used to be a brigadier back in the day mama meeta tika kalakata pera sita the hamuda hamuda the director of law from the uh, of the army i i have sent a letter to the director of law uh, from the arm of the army asking whether this particular individual is uh, still part of the military uh, and what is the date what is the gazette number which which released him but i have not received any response from them up to now another judge recently left sri lanka uh, i had many hopes about him but he has left the country now so such things are quite common in sri lanka
in your quest for justice for your husband, what are the threats that you personally faced? I think from 2010, so that was, so from the very first day uh, on 25th of January 2010, I, uh, from that day that I went to the police, I had been facing many threats. First of all, there was a lot of, uh, this, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, threat threats and also uh, defamation by police officials. By April 2010, the matter of my husband's abduction had been handed over to the Colombo uh, CID, Criminal uh, Investigation Division. When I went there asking them what's going on with my husband's case, they would go and say, why don't you go and check with the soothsayer? They said I should be doing, I should be checking with the shaman, soothsayers to see whether he, my husband, where my husband is. Responsible officials from Sri Lanka. Mr. Mohan Piris, the former Attorney General of Sri Lanka, he is the. He was the Sri Lankan representative to the Human Rights Commi Council. Uh, uh, he participated in the CAT committee representing Sri Lanka. So he claims that Pragit is living abroad and that they have proof of it. Later on, he came to the courts and he said he does not know where Pragit is. So that is one person. Then another person, another official said that Pragit is living in another country. Later on, when the investigations into this matter were launched, they claimed that me and Pragit are members of the LTTE. They said that Pragit took money from the LTTE. They said that Pragit is working for the LTTE. Uh, military intelligence officers very uh, publicly put up posters against me. And in 2016, within the court's premises, a well-known Buddhist priest in Sri Lanka threatened me and he scolded me. He said, my husband is a tiger, an LTTE member. He said, you go and beg by the roadside. That is what he told me. They did not stop there. They kept, they used the internet to uh, defame me and my uh, children. This caused a lot of uh, emotional, mental harm to, to, to us. In Sri Lanka, there is a lot of bullying happening uh, on the internet, but there is no law, there is no justice, no way to seek justice regarding internet bullying. So we had to just bear it all. One thing that they said is that we will kill your children. They said we will kill your children and we will feed you those children. What a cruel thing to say to a mother. Saying that we will feed you your dead children. That is the level of harassment that I felt I, uh, that I had to undergo. I feel that I am the most harassed woman in the country. Thank you. I have no further questions. Is there anything else you would like to share with us before I hand over the floor to the judges for further questions? Yes, I do. I would like to say that let me just share my journey with you. I will do that very briefly. My journey 
started on 25th of january 2010 so this journey has different has been taking different paths on one hand i went to the courts uh, now we have the courts uh, the legislative uh, we have the judiciary uh, legislative and the executive i approached all three i wrote letters i wrote petitions i filed cases i directed letters uh, i i sent letters directly to the executive as well so that is one part of my my uh, my struggle then secondly i had my struggle on the roads by the road side mama my family is the my first family is the is our all victims who uh, faced a similar plight as me my second family is Sinhalese Tamil Muslim brothers and sisters who are victims of abduction like uh, like I did so throughout my lifetime i have continued this uh, struggle on the road with them so in this effort i have used cultural and religious uh, aspects i have incorporated them uh, to uh, depict our plight very creatively but that's that's part two of it then uh, next i have gone before the human rights human right uh, uh, un human rights council i have represented my community my brothers and sisters who are victims similar to me i was able to get the attention of these uh, i was able to bring attention to these victims and i felt empowered to continue this journey and with that throughout the world different organizations uh, different activists uh, media personnel uh, started uh, focusing their attention on me uh, with their support i was able to spread this news spread our voice all throughout the globe so these are the parts of my journey that i would like to share with you there is much more to say but i would like just like to say this a uh, very uh, brief these things very briefly i think mama hitanne the one of the strategies that i used in my struggle are the uh, faiths and beliefs that people in power have i have used this to make them afraid i have used them to put pressure on on them today i am happy to see that in sri lanka a lot of people see me as a pioneer of of a very long journey given the current political crisis this is even much more so thank you for your very moving uh, testimony about your struggle and your uh, example in this uh, in this uh, cause we'd like to turn to some questions uh, do we have the uh, remote judges uh, please on the screen if not i'll ask any of the judges here first would anybody like to ask any question yes maria rosa so thank you very much um, uh, we are all deeply touched 
uh, by your testimony. Uh, my question is, since the abduction and the disappearance of uh, Ragit, have, have you ever received any kind of uh, support uh, by public institutions uh, or public opinion, I mean legal, uh, financial, psychological support, and uh, public recognition that you are a victim of the crime? Again, so, so I want to thank you again for your testimony and what I was saying that we are all deeply touched for by your uh, words. And my question is, since the abduction and the disappearance of Pragit, um, have you ever received uh, any kind of support by representatives of public institutions or public opinion, I mean legal, psychological support and um, a recognition, a formal recognition that you are a victim of a crime. Uh, I would like to represent on the public uh, institutions. At the very first, I would like to speak about the Chief Justice uh, Office. That was the first uh, office I met. In this case, in the writ of habeas corpus, the government's representative is the Chief Justice Department. That is really against me, I should say. And all the officers are coming under this Chief Justice Office is also acted in the same manner. During the investigation in the writ of habeas corpus. There were cross examinations. When he was cross examining me, he was asking about the reference of United Nations with me and where I went and various other issues related to the monetary issues. And he was also questioning me as to how he was uh, disappearing. He was asking from me, the representatives uh, from the Chief Justice Office. Even in the police stations, I have told that I have not received any positive responses. I also stated that although the opposition was supporting and uh, speaking in my favor, and it was brought to the parliament. During the time of uh, my case being heard, and when it was uh, brought to the parliament, all the ruling party ministers and the strong supporters have opposed and said that I have been acting on a false case. It was the response given to me by the state sector. I have also had a lot of communications with the police stations, CPJ's office, and various other new institutions. After 2015, the management and the shape of these offices have completely changed. And the officers of the CID came to me and they started investigating. And during that time, in 2015, the CP, the Chief Justice uh, 
office has uh, really started probing this. And at that time, they represent me and they are representing my grievances and my complaint. The Chief Justice Office, the Criminal Investigations Office, and the Army Office all have started investigating this in a combination. And the Army has not given any support to the CPJ's office. At the initial stage, they come out to say that uh, they are not able to provide the information needed to the vulnerable courts because they are injuries to the national protection. And also, they further came to say that uh, all these officers were burnt and all the evidence and witnesses were burnt. That was the response shown by the required army officers. Also, they came out to say false evidences are referred by them. And some reference numbers are misguided and they do not come out with the real reference numbers to the cases. And uh, members, individuals who have different identifying numbers have been brought to the courts. And that was really to say that these numbers are not matching. We, uh, although this is a criminal case, the responsibilities are really borne by the government and it should have been done like that, but it was not properly investigated. It is a duty and responsibility of the government institutions to provide the necessary evidence and various other witnesses. When a criminal offense is investigated, the government institutions and the Defense Ministry will have to provide information and evidences, but these institutions are operating under a political mechanism. Although the individuals or army or the government institutions are there, they will have to work under the obligation of the political guidance. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. We have one question uh, from uh, Gil Berger in Australia uh, concerning when you want concerning uh, the um, you mentioned a judge had to leave Sri Lanka for his safety, and the question is: Was that judge who left uh, involved in hearing any of your cases? As long as I am aware, during the year, during the early part of 2022, this year, the, the chief judge of the courts has left the country. He has shown the reason that he has to serve in another country as a judge. That is why he has to leave the country. I am not aware as to why the Honorable Judge has left the country. But the society has studied the real situation behind this uh, happening. It is because of the fear and the fear psychosis that the Honorable Judge had because of the Rajapaksha's and the Rajapaksha's regime. He had to leave. 
I am not aware whether the statement made by the Honorable Judge is true or false. Thank you. Thank you. I have another question from uh, Judge Nell. Uh, in your testimony, passionate and comprehensive testimony for which I thank you, you told us that you had received threats also from, from Buddhists, if I have understood correctly. I would like to, you to give us more information on the role of Buddhists in the hostility and the repression of free press and of freedom of press. At the very outset, I would like to come out to say this was done by the uh, religious fantas religious persons who are with some religious fantasism. I am not blaming all the Buddhists in Sri Lanka. This is uh, really the bhikkhus, the Buddhist clergy who were working for Rajapaksas, not all, but some certain certain people, certain Buddhist monks who are working for the Rajapaksa regime have taken the responsibility of harassing me and giving and threatening me. I know that they are directly involved in threatening me and uh, harassing me, as has been indicated. They, wanted, they really wanted me to commit suicide. They were crushing me and they were using uh, big influence. I can't uh, really stop uh, my husband from writing. Sometimes these media institutions are directly connected to certain politicians. Sometimes they could be business connections that they have with the Rajapaksas. So the Rajapaksas, want, they, they want to work for the Rajapaksas. They want to work in favor of the Rajapaksas. Then the truth never comes out to the society. Then secondly, the matter of military. Because sometimes there were media institutions who supported me and who uh, helped me send my message out. But later on, they started... Uh, they stopped it and they started uh, just representing these uh, military officials. I have noticed that happening. So self-censorship, of course, happens and uh, messages or information not being conveyed to the society uh, due to certain coercion, acts of coercion and sometimes uh, threat, uh, threats being leveled against uh, journalists. These things occur. Uh, hello, thank you for your testimony. Uh, I want to ask about the first abduction of your husband. Uh, if you want, if you can talk about what happened during that abduction, if he received some warnings, some threats, what, what he told when he returned, what he, to, what, uh, what he saw, everything like that. And my second question is about the enforced disappearances of journalists. If you know, how many journalists uh, are disappeared and how extended uh, is this crime in 
uh, in your country when if there is a pattern why sometimes they kill people sometimes they disappear people what is your uh, uh, what have you understand on all these years uh, with other victims also that you know thank you uh, to answer your first question when uh, Pragit was abducted for the first time, we had no idea that he is under threat. On that morning, Pragit went, had gone to his land in uh, Sigiriya, and uh, in the evening, he was on his way back. I spoke to him around 10.30 p.m. I asked him, uh, what time will you be back? So that was his, my last telephone call to him before the abduction. So at that time, he said, I am now in Kadavata. It will be around 12 o'clock when I return home. I'll be coming home. That is what he said. But Pragit did not come home by 12 o'clock. I tried calling him. The first time I tried to call him, the phone rang. The connection, the, the phone rang. But I kept trying because I could not speak to him. So later on, uh, I got the message that the phone is disconnected. And then I kept uh, trying to uh, contacting him, trying to call him. I thought he must have fallen asleep on the bus and he had forgotten to got off the bus uh, in the right place because he fell asleep and maybe the battery in his phone died. So the next morning, I called some friends uh, and tried to uh, look for him. Around 11.30 on the next day, a friend of his spoke to me and said, Pragit's phone is now working, please call him. So I called him and he told me, I faced some trouble, can you come to the bus uh, stand uh, with a pair of uh, slippers for me. So I went there. I saw Pragit looking very, very tired. That was my first, uh, that is what I saw. Then we came home. After coming home, Pragit said that on the day before, he was walking on the road, a vehicle, a white vehicle passed him and stopped on the middle of the road. It was around 12 o'clock in the night. The vehicle stopped and some people who had their faces covered uh, got out. They were using some very bad language and they put uh, handcuffs on Pragit's hand and he was pretty much pushed under the seat of that vehicle and he was taken away. And after that, he was taken to some location and there was some sort of a ring that was attached to the floor. So the handcuffs were fixed to that ring that is attached to the floor. And there was a very bright light right ahead, like ahead, um, right um, in front of him. And there was very loud sounds being uh, played on uh, some device. He could hear very loud noises. And he had asked, Pragit had asked uh, the people there to help him take the medication that was in his pocket. But they had not helped him. They said, they had said, you will get your medicine after our boss gets here. So Pragit had to spend that, spend the night in that place. Uh, 
on the next morning they let him uh, go to the bathroom by that time his blindfold had been removed so when he went to that bathroom he had seen some bloody clothes in that bathroom then they had blindfolded him again and uh, taken him uh, to their leader and this leader had told pragit that we brought you here by a mistake we are going to release you now and pragit had asked them as to why you took me into why you grabbed me from the road you have my identity card and all the things that were in my pocket so how could you make a mistake you knew very well who i was that is what he had said then another man who was standing there had said you are speaking too much you should shut up and then they had blindfolded him again and brought him to another location where this is uh, an area called uh, kaduvela they had dropped him off near an abandoned stone quarry uh, there were some thorns on the like there were some thorny bushes there and he had been asked to sit down on the floor he said he felt terrified as to what is going to happen next then he had been asked to stay there without moving uh he had to, he had been asked to not remove the blindfold until he cannot hear the sound of their vehicle anymore so he just stood there until he could not hear the sound of the vehicle and then he had removed his blindfold and he had come home and that is when we went to the uh, police to lodge a complaint so this is the experience that he shared with me regarding that day so from that day up until up until 2010 he faced many threats then we know that uh, some kisiam ho some people started following him and uh, near our house there was a, there were vehicles with uh, with covered number plates we could not see the number plate uh, so and we received uh, unidentified uh, telephone calls and uh, we took certain uh, security measures to the best of our ability for example sometimes pragit would change the routes he would take a different route than his usual road uh, to get to his office and he usually went in uh, public uh, transportation so that he could be around other people so he took some uh, precautions sometimes if he gets late uh, to come home he would uh, be accompanied by a friend he would not never come home alone in the during the night however when the second abduction took place now uh, pragit had this weakness uh, they used that weakness that is pragit always wanted to help other people he was a man of great humanity and that humanity is what they used to abduct him the second time Uh, especially he wanted to support uh, other communities so there was a tamil person who said that he needs some help he needs help to get out of sri lanka and that is when pragit and then and he wanted to meet pragit so that is the uh, leo they used to get hold of pragit uh, the second time i see this uh, strategy being used when abducting uh, other um, journalists as well the answer to your second question asu devana prashne vana yeah 
Thank you. Can you repeat the second question again? Please remember the second question. It, it was how extended is the forced disappearances in Sri Lanka and in the case of journalists also? How many journalists have been disappeared? And if you have noticed some pattern of when they murder people and when they disappear people. The disappearances actually began uh, to around mid uh, 70s, 1970s. And I say this as a strategy used by political authority to subvert and terrorize people. It is one of their tools of subversion, uh, in my uh, opinion. And uh, if I am to talk about the patterns, during the 1988-89 period, uh, the same strategies were used to subvert the riots that happened in the South. Uh, even during that time, enforced disappearances took place. Uh, even during that time, Mahindra Rajapaksa was dealing with that. Actually, he is the one who lodged about 60,000 complaints uh, at the UN Human Rights Commission uh, regarding these abductions. During the war in the north and after the war, groups of people were disappeared. Uh, regarding numbers, there are many, many uh, discrepancies regarding numbers, so I prefer not to give you a number, uh, but talking about media, journalists, uh, I don't really have a clear idea as to how many journalists have been disappeared, but I do know that includes uh, journalists from the north, and the South, if I were to give, a, give you a number, it would be unfair if my number is not correct. Therefore, I prefer not to give you a number. However, this pattern of disappearances is quite evident. Firstly, these people are disappeared uh, during the latter part or the last stages of the war. The military was under the, the north was under the military. There were unarmed civilians there who, and then there were people who joined the LTT sometimes without their own consent during the latter. However, the people who were surrendering or people who were willing to undergo, um, who, were, who, were, who, were, who were surrendered to the military, disappeared due, due to the war and due to other reasons. Many people were killed as well and uh, some were disappeared. Then the other thing is that any person who poses a threat to their authority, their power, any person who might bring to light any fact related to their corruption, that includes journalists, human rights protectors, human rights activists, such people are disappeared 
often times this happens it could be in the north or in the south this happened very often and also in some occasions i have met some people who were this uh, the the, the uh, families of whom were disappeared uh, in order to hide evidence of crimes that were committed i'll give you an example in colombo in mattakulia of colombo a three wheeler driver he is a Uh, a three wheeler driver was supposed to uh, transport a man uh, in his three wheeler so this man is a tamil man who came to sri lanka from canada so uh, while they were on this journey uh, somebody stops their vehicle and this uh, man was taken it to custody so the three wheeler driver says this man is my client who was riding on my three wheeler why are you taking him into custody so what do they do they abduct the three wheeler driver as well it has been 13 years now nobody knows the whereabouts of this three wheeler driver so this is the kind of abductions that took place these are the strategies they used i think this is a common feature in many cases uh, now a lot of abductions happen because they are trying to hide some information or they are trying to sometimes these are people who uh, surrendered to them then uh, the journalists human rights activists underlying all of these uh, actions you can see uh, objectives such as uh, intimidation subversion i the criminal investigation division has told me that pragit is no more from the criminal cases this is evident but there are thousands hundreds of thousands of mothers are still crying because they do not know what happened to their children sometimes they they keep hugging that same photograph uh, that has been with them for decades there because that is all that remains with them in the north and in the south these mothers are crying out for justice so their lamentation has to stop and that has to be they have to have some sort of closure whether it happens in sri lanka or abroad it does not matter that is why i have committed that is why i say truth telling and uh, justice is what uh, that that is absolutely necessary thank you so much for sharing with you with us your not only your difficult and painful story but also your understanding of the general situation thank you uh back to the prosecutor i think that's the end from the the judges we we have more questions but we're running out of time it seems there are there are many women Uh, there are many uh, victims uh, similar to me in sri lanka so i i bow my head and in respect to all of you thank you very much